The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer to peer. Hi, buddy. How's it going? Hey, happy time change day. I'm to, I know. <laughs> oh, gosh. I know. It actually hit me more. I feel like I'm still like tired. I was in Mexico last week. <laughs> and now I came back to a, a time change. So. Well, we don't even have a time change here. It, it didn't happen here. It's I don't know. We're like delayed or something. No, daylight saving time yeah, was last. Yeah, it was last Sunday. week. Yeah, 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 last weekend. Yeah. So when okay. I can't, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I feel okay. like kind of a little jet laggy. Okay. Yeah, you got me all okay. <laughs> like. There's another. No, time. no, no. <laughs> We're changing it, it back. <laughs> 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 I don't know. Maybe my phone hasn't updated, but I'm showing um, 925, and I think you guys are on 1125 right now. Usually, we're just an hour behind. So I think yeah, Mexico yeah. doesn't. I don't think Mexico changes just yet. It might be like I don't know next week or yeah, US, sometime soon. U.S. changed last. Yeah, it Sunday. changed last Sunday. Yeah. So when I woke up Sunday, there it was like two hours. Yeah, yeah I remember. Yeah. Like I was like, oh, it's only ten yes. o'clock. But we, anyway, we get to have the pleasure of this conversation twice a year since like, the world doesn't even do that. Every country does their time change slightly differently. So it's, it's a mess. It's a mess. <laughs> Yeah. Not as big a mess as the uh, as the whole banking system right now. Right, right. If they if they can't get the time right, how are they going to get the banking system coordinated? Right. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, man. An another major another major week in the in the broader economy and the crypto economy. Right. Yep. Yeah. Almost not a moment after we got off the horn last week, they um, they did some intervention and they papered over everything. They fixed it, so we're good now. We can go up. <laughs> <laughs> so give us the lowdown, man. Okay, so um, the the graph we're looking at right here is the uh, the total assets on the Federal Reserve balance sheet. Um, this is something called the Wednesday level. The like the formal official number comes out once a month, um, but this kind of gives you the sort of um, the tentative view on a weekly basis. So this is a very long uh, time view right here. You can see how their balance sheet just expanded massively in two thousand eight or two thousand nine when they started QE. Um, we have this like very long period where they tried to basically stop purchasing assets. It's like a heroin addict trying to come off the addiction. Um, but ultimately, they were unable to do that. And then, of course, uh, you know, we had the whole COVID. Oh, crap. I'm not supposed to say that word. The whole <laughs> bump. OK, so <laughs> the thing that's important here is if we zoom into a local time frame, you can see that um, things bumped up here by, I believe it was like 150 billion, something like that. I, I think by the end of the week, it was more like 160 billion. So. Um, why did this happen? Why did their balance sheet suddenly expand when they're, they've been trying so hard for the last year to reduce it? So on Sunday, uh, which is very unusual for them to put out publications um, of big news like this on Sunday. Um, but what happened last Sunday was the Federal Reserve created, well, they did two main things. They created a special lending facility. So if you remember, we talked about these banks like SVB that were holding long-term low yield debt. And that debt was now less valuable than the newer debt being issued because the newer debts uh, was being issued at like four and a half percent, whereas they were holding something like one and a half percent. So effectively, if you want to sell that lower yielding bond, you have to offer people a discount. So even though you might have a bond value to say a billion dollars, that would be the quote unquote par value. You would have to sell that thing at maybe 90 cents on the dollar just to convince someone to buy it because people are like, why would I buy your bond? I can go buy a new bond that's yielding four and a half percent. So they were holding all that on their balance sheet and um, they ideally, they didn't intend to sell it. They don't want to sell this stuff. They intend to hold it into maturity because then after like 10 years, because it was long-term bonds they were holding after 10 years, they can turn it back into the government. The government will give them all of their value, the par value plus the interest. So um, this was, this, it looks fine on the balance sheet. Um, it, it like, the way that they do the banking regulation in the United States, at least, allows them to not write that off as a loss. But when when um, these tech startups were all withdrawing all their money because, you know, bear market, um, they were having to meet liquidity. They were having to start selling off bonds. That surprised everyone. It caused a run on the bank. They couldn't meet their immediate liquidity. So the FDIC takes over. The bank's going to fail. And now all the depositors are going to get paid back, you know, whatever it is that uh, of the assets the bank is holding, which the FDIC on Sunday uh, and the Treasury and the Federal Reserve basically um, insured. They said, You're, every depositor is going to get everything back. So everything's fine. Stop panicking, everybody. Stop making a run on the banks. And so effectively, what they did is they created this new lending facility that allows... I'm sorry, I know this is really dry. <laughs> it occurs to me as I'm, as I'm saying this as fast as I can. So 
they created this special lending facility where banks like SVB um, could have, I mean, they already failed, but uh, banks that are in a similar situation can put up as collateral these long-term low-yielding debt, and the Federal Reserve will loan them the par value of that asset um, at the overnight rate plus a 10 basis point increase, so 0.1% above the overnight federal funds rate. So what it means is that um, these banks now that might be in trouble don't have to sell those bonds at a loss. They can just put them up as collateral at the Fed, and, uh, and they can get a temporary loan, uh, a one-year loan to meet immediate liquidity. Now, it's not exactly an attractive proposition. We'll talk more about this why. We'll talk about um, some of the bond rates and, and numbers there. But um, ultimately, so that was, that was one major thing they did. Only $11 billion has been loaned out with that lending facility. However, the, the other thing they did that was major, um, there's something called the discount window. And it's not like... Um, it's not an adjective. It's, it's actually a thing. It's like a lending facility that, that's part of the Federal Reserve since its creation. And it basically allows banks to put up collateral um, to meet immediate liquidity needs. And typically, if a bank was going to put something like a treasury or a bond as collateral with the Federal Reserve to get a loan from them, they, the, the Federal Reserve would only loan them less than the full value of that bond as a protection mechanism in case you know the bank uh, fails or whatever. So, what the Federal Reserve decided to do on Sunday was that they were going to give people the full value of whatever bond um, that they uh, that they were putting up as collateral. So it's kind of like they created the separate the this separate lending facility, which hilariously is called the BTFP. I don't even remember the name of this acronym. Um, I'm not even going to try, but I thought it was hilarious because, like, you know, buy the fucking dip, B BTFD. And so they make this lending facility called BTFP, which I guess means buy the fucking pump at this point. Um, so that's, you know, that was to me ironic. But um, anyways, the point is that the, the main action happened not in the new facility that they created, but in the relaxed requirements of the old facility, the discount window um, that they had created uh, or that was already, sorry, in existence. So um what we saw was a massive expansion of the balance sheet and people, banks took, it was something like $153 billion on Wednesday, but then it was like $160 or $170 billion by the time the week closed. Um, so that's quite a lot of money, as you can imagine. Now, we need to understand the reason why this happened, um, because there's a question here. Is this just banks trying to meet liquidity so that they don't go under because people are withdrawing their funds, so they're taking loans, you know, and it's not really going to hit the economy. It's just banks trying to not, you know not go under, right? They, they, they need the immediate liquidity. So they're taking all these loans because people are uncertain. So they're moving their funds and companies are moving their funds, right? Is it just that? Because the, the discount window is just a 90 day time frame. So when a bank puts up collateral and takes a loan from the Federal Reserve on that basis, it's a 90 day, maximum 90 day. Um, some of them do shorter time frames. It's a maximum 90 day loan. So it could just be people trying to meet short-term liquidity, but um, when we start looking at these numbers, you're going to understand that, uh, no, this is just free money. They just handed free money to the banks. Um, so, okay, you've got the, the, flat light, uh, the flat white line, this guy right here. That is the current federal funds rate. And then I want you to pay attention to these uh, two kind of grayish lines right here. The, the lighter one, that's the three-month uh, three yield for the U.S. Treasuries. And then the dark gray one, that's the six month yield on US treasuries. And finally, this dotted white line is the effective rate that these banks are gonna have to pay at the discount window when they take that loan from the Federal Reserve. Um, it's basically 0.1% uh, higher than the Federal Reserve, the federal funds rate. So what do you notice? The dotted line uh, on Monday, actually let's go to the four hour. This will make, this will be a lot easier to see on the four hour. So, Let's go to the beginning of the week, which would be right here, Sunday, Monday. Here we go. Uh, let's put a vertical line right there. Okay, so right where that vertical line appeared, that's the beginning of the week. You'll notice all of these treasuries that are yielding higher than the rate that these banks are going to lend from from the Federal Reserve. So basically, they can put up collateral, take money, take a loan from the Federal Reserve at 4.67% interest, and then go buy treasuries that are all yielding higher. So this was just totally free money for them. Anything they put in there, they're getting the difference, the spread on these yields right here. So you'll notice that uh, essentially, oh, crap, you know what? Sorry, that's the, I, I messed up right here. I made a little mistake. Um, so that was two Mondays ago. Here is the actual beginning. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, all right. <laughs> 
but but anyways, the same thing applies, right? So okay, so here's Monday. All right, so this right here is Monday. That's uh, that yellow line, and then again, but still same deal. You can see that all of the uh, all of the rates are above the rate that they have to lend. So it's just free money. They can put money with the Federal Reserve, take a loan, then turn around and use that money. Oh, and another big part of this was the Fed said that you can use that for anything you want. Banks, you're, there there was no restrictions on what they could use this money for that they're getting these loans from the Federal Reserve. <clears throat> so. Uh, effectively, what happened is they all bought a whole bunch of bonds, and then so we saw the the rates on bonds, uh, at least the the one year uh, the one year maturity, essentially went down below the rate that that can be lent out or that they can get from the Federal Reserve. But um, I don't know exactly how this happened, but for the entire week, basically, the three and six month yields were all still above the rate that they could get from the federal reserve so again just totally free money by the end of the week it looks like um, rates have finally dropped down just a little bit below that critical line right there but effectively this is what happened now that doesn't mean that 153 billion new dollars is going into the economy immediately um that those loans all have to get paid back within 90 days and it's unlikely that the federal reserve is going to keep this discount window relaxed for a long period of time but it does mean that some billions of dollars are effectively being printed so it's kind of like it, it, it's interesting because it's it's kind of like a way of giving some of these banks a little bit of extra profits that they might need to sort of um, improve their balance sheet. But it's people are saying that like the QE, the money printers turned back on and they bailed everyone out and yada yada and it's and it's time for bull market and et cetera. And I basically see that everywhere that's ubiquitous almost. But the reality is that it's it's really not quite as uh, free for all extravaganza. This is not a post two thousand eight. QE unlocked, QE infinity. I mean, okay, in some ways it is because we know that they'll always do quantitative easing. They'll always be there to bail the banks out. And, and they always have to be because, okay, inflation is bad, but we've dealt with 10% inflation, 15% inflation. America has survived that um, even for a decade, right? So that's survivable. But what's not survivable is default on the debt, like hardcore, actual, we can't pay. We have to default in bankrupts as a nation. We have to, we have to like redo all of the deals that we have. So default is like the worst case scenario for them. So they'll almost always print their way out of this. So, but at the moment, this isn't like a crazy printing extravaganza, but the market is very convinced that it is. And in some ways, it's basically getting rid of the negatives that happened that brought the market down. Um, like we were talking about two weeks ago where I said, hey, be on it. Things could crash here at any moment. Um, the, the charts are looking bad. As soon as they break down, it's time to get out. Well, that was all the banking, um, all these banking woes that were happening. Uh, that That's what would cause that. So now that those are alleviated, basically everything is coming back uh, coming back into like basically above their, their crash, their doom levels. So, okay, so that's bonds right there. Let's go ahead and... Um, Let's just go to crypto. We'll go straight to crypto because this makes, you know, we'll talk about Bitcoin actually because it makes the most sense to look at this chart. Um, so as we usually do, we just kind of take a quick zoom out here so everyone can kind of see what uh, what the long term looks like. Let's add some of these uh, some of these large lines right here so that we can just get a, a feel for what the big chart looks like. Um, so you know, we've got our basically our, our bear uh, our bear trend or our bear market downtrend line. We've got this very long uptrend line. Um, essentially, Bitcoin has recovered those levels. So, right, this bottom dotted line, that was the FTX doom level. That was an important level for us. And you can see that this wick down that happened on this past week um, basically brought us back to the bear market trend line and then bounced right off of it. Of course, it bounced off because, uh, you know, because of the intervention. So let's go to some shorter time frames and let's take off or let's add the, uh, the more local view here on our, on our pleb lines. Uh, for a second, we'll just keep this looking slightly schizophrenic just so that you can kind of have um, a broader idea. We'll go to the four hour time frame so it's not too painful on the eyes. Um, so again, right here, we're basically uh, touching that bear market resistance or sorry, bear market. Um, well, it was resistance and then it turned into support, right? By bouncing off of this line, it turned into support and then basically regained the channel. And so now we'll take off, we'll remove the, uh, the macro stuff or the long term stuff. So basically, you can see that we had this kind of like uh, upwards channel that was, you know, essentially defining the action for this year as uh, as things took off. So we broke that down and then immediately came back. Um, there was the question on USDC. And as we talked about last week, USDC was never in any real trouble. Um, worst case, they might have lost three hundred million dollars. And then um, but th th they make so much yield. They, they're so profitable for the past few years that th they really were never in any danger. Um, but at any rate, um, part of what drove 
this bottoming right here was the the fear of USDC that people thought, oh crap, USDC is going down, the banks are going down. I better get into real crypto now. And so that was a big part of really this part of the trend. And then uh, and then when the Fed came out and well, the, both the Fed and the Treasury and the FDIC came out and. Uh, promised to backstop everything, you know, that was basically game on again. And I tweeted about that in real time saying, Hey, they just, they bailed everyone out, right? Quote unquote bailed out. It, it wasn't quite as bailout as you might think in terms of like 2008, you know, but they did do some intervention like that. We, we have to, we have to recognize that there was intervention that was done. I do think they tried to use a light touch. They tried to do as little as they had to. Um, but uh, you know, it, it, it is a bit shady the way that they just handed banks free money essentially on that interest rate spread. So do you, do you think that initial, you know, you're saying when what kind of we, we pumped up was people moving to crypto as a safe haven asset because they had nowhere else to go? Or is it just because they anticipated that, you know, the Fed was going to do some kind of, uh, you know, whatever quantitative easing or they weren't going to raise interest rates as fast or potentially even pivot? Was it was the pump because of what? You know, anticipating what the Fed was going to do, or is it really potentially because of people seeing value in crypto as a uh, you know store of value asset? I, I think it was a little bit of both, um, but primarily this part right here of the pump was driven by the fear that USDC was about to permanently depeg mm -hmm. because people were panicking. They were dumping their USDC. They wanted to get anything that they could. So Tether also um, bumped up higher than, than the dollar par value, but people were also buying all kinds of crypto with that. So um, that was a factor. There definitely, I'm sure there was a factor about people being afraid of banking contagion. So they were probably also buying crypto with real US dollars. Um, you know, so there was like the fear component. There was also the, Hey, I need to get into a real sovereign asset component. Um, and I think both of those made up and also, as you said, the people expecting that, well, the banks are going to bail everything out or sorry, the fed's going to bail everything out. So everything will be fine probably. Um, so I think that's what made up this initial pump right here. Uh, and then essentially, so you can see right here on Sunday, it was right about here. Uh, that's right where the fed came out with their announcement on Sunday. So after that, it's like, all right, this is game on. Like they just bailed everything out. The only reason that we even like did this whole dip down was because of um, SVB and, and the potential uh, banking problems looming. So with that all gone, it's like, all right, you know, it, it's back to game on, right? We just recovered the exact channel that we've been here for, for months now. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question there. Yeah, yeah. So um, we've got Bitcoin is Bitcoin dominance is, um, if you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about how it looks like you know, Bitcoin dominance was kind of going vertical uh, or going parabolic, I should say. And uh, and then it broke down and then it just kind of, you know, busted out of all of these lines in the last uh, in the last week. So um, to me, that's that's slightly sus. And we'll talk a bit more about this as well. But um, effectively, markets have recovered. Yes. But they haven't just like massively, massively recovered to the top of their trend like Bitcoin just did. I get the feeling, and especially in combination with some of the action we're seeing on Monero and just in general across the markets, I get the feeling that there is still kind of a limited amount of cash out there. There's not unlimited cash. And so the market makers in crypto, this feels a lot like the end of 2020 when they're trying to pump Bitcoin. They're trying to convince the, the retail markets that it's game on and you need to be getting into crypto. So what do they do? They have limited resources, so they throw them at the thing that's going to make the most impact psychologically, and that's Bitcoin. It's still Bitcoin. Bitcoin is, you know, 45% starting to push. What is that? 48, 46, 47% right now dominance. Um, so I do think that they're trying to sort of spark the uh, spark the FOMO here. I think they'll be somewhat successful for a while, but I don't. I still don't believe this is the real bull market. I still don't believe this is like. I don't see hyperinflation right here. I don't see, um, you know, I still see significant amount of problems here uh, in, in a lot of ways. So uh, I mean, one thing that Balaji come out and say, uh, Bitcoin's going to hit a million dollars within the next <laughs> 90 days or something. Yeah. Here's the tweet. But yeah, this guy, I, I would take his bet. That'd be the easiest million dollars he ever made, you know, but um, so 90 day term, holy crap. That's so dumb. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I don't know. I've never heard of this guy before, but oh, you never heard of him? Uh, he's no. a, he's a big Zcash shill as well. So oh my god, all credibility lost there. I mean, the guy, you know, he ha he has some amazing takes, but he clearly seems to be just trying to pump Bitcoin, like the next yeah. Michael Saylor, right? 
Well, well here's XMR Zcash. So if he's a big Zcash shill, you know, he's uh, for the past few years, you know, he, he's down like, I don't know, that looks like 27x. 2,700% Monero has outperformed Zcash since, uh, since 2017. And, and, and let's just, let's just take a look in the, uh, in the local market. Monero has outperformed Zcash by almost 4X, 265%. So, uh, yeah, so Balaji's probably losing a lot of money. Uh, although, I mean, let's be real. He probably has some friends somewhere that's going to take the bet, you know, or someone that he knows and uh, he'll lose the bet, and then he'll get that million dollars back, or something, right? Like no one would be that dumb. M maybe he is. Uh, I don't know. I've never seen this guy. So, w what do you think? I don't know. I mean, he's you know <laughs> big Silicon Valley. I think you know he's he's worth billions, or right? I mean, the guy is, is mega successful. Um, he's he's viewed uh, as being like this, you know, uh, thought leader that's able to predict the future. T H O T. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I, I judge people based on what I know. And just to see that he, over the years, has completely kind of dismissed and ignored Monero and tried to pump Zcash makes me extremely suspicious. So I don't really, I think he's, yeah, he's just trying to uh, do a, a Bitcoin pump here. I, I don't know what his, the backroom deal is that he has to, to ensure that he doesn't lose that mill, but. Well, I do think it's game on. I mean, there, there's almost no doubt here that it's it's game on for crypto. It's game on for the S and P 500 for the Nasdaq. In fact, um, one thing that was very interesting that happened this week is that um, so this is the Nasdaq divided by the S and P. So it's the ratio of how well they're doing. Mm -hmm. And this was basically the bottom of the bear market here. The Nasdaq has outperformed the S and P by 13, percent which which is huge. Um, so you can see this is the long time frame right here. This was the top of the bull market. Uh, and that was obviously the bottom of the bear market. So it's basically the NASDAQ has recovered half of what it lost relative to the S&P. So um, it does look like uh, tech stocks are, are back on. Um, there's another, we can look at a few more interesting charts here as well. Uh, if I can find them. Uh, here we go. Uh, so this is Bitcoin divided by the NASDAQ daily candles. So, um, you know, you can see this was obviously the, the first top and then relative to the nasdaq bitcoin actually did not make uh, a secondary high or it didn't make a it didn't make a new all-time high relative to the nasdaq and then we've been in this bear market the thing that's interesting is there's been kind of this like capping line right here and bitcoin just like totally uh totally smashed through that uh this week so uh it does look like bitcoin has relative strength to the nasdaq and the nasdaq has relative strength to the s p which is a good indication again that things are just game on uh, things are ready to to be going to uh, to higher highs here. Uh, maybe not new all time highs on the markets, but you know we we should see positive action. Um, the S and P right now is having trouble specifically because the banking sector is having problems. Um, people are kind of worried about that, and the banks are all part of the S and P uh, 500 index, which is kind of like they're more like your your stable corporations, your big corporations, stuff like that. Um, whereas the Nasdaq is just tech stocks. So NASDAQ is already well on its way to trying to beat this, um, this, uh, this one spot right here, the, you know, the spot that we kind of, uh, got rejected at. Um, so yeah, I do expect, um, I mean, it, to me, it's just game on, like things are going to continue going up. They, it looks to me like they're trying to convince retail, trying to convince the plebs like, Hey, everybody get into the market. It's the new bull market. You've got this, you know, Balaji guy that's over here trying to, you know, get people into the market and, um, I don't believe it though. Like temporarily I do. It looks to me like things are going to continue going up. Um, I'm basically almost totally in the market right here, but um, we still have the same, we still have kind of the same issues, the same problems. So for example, uh, even though the balance sheet pumped uh, significantly, you can't see it on this chart yet. Um, but uh, uh, maybe, I don't know. I guess I don't have the Wednesday level, but that, that's all right. Even though the balance sheet pumped significantly right here as of the past week, Within the next three months, that should all get paid back. Now, I don't know if they'll keep rolling that. I don't know how long the Fed is going to keep this discount window open. Um, but we also have the, the M2 money supply kind of took a little bump up um, starting in, in January. So we'll have to kind of wait and see. These numbers are delayed by like a month. Uh, so, so, for example, you can see the last numbers we have here are for January and it's already March. So we're not even going to know what happened in February. Probably the M2 increase because the markets were going up. Um, Let's see, the inflation numbers were um, middle of the road, kind of what was expected. Um, so the CPI came down um, as much as expected, but the core didn't come down. It, it was like slightly higher than they thought it would be. 
Um, but it's still coming down, but you can see it's still kind of sticky. The, the core inflation is in blue here. And this is what the Federal Reserve actually looks at for making their decisions. Uh, one mistake I made last week is that I thought the Federal Reserve meeting was last week. I don't know why I thought that. Maybe I was looking at the wrong um, at the wrong calendar. But at any rate, FOMC meeting is Wednesday of this upcoming week. So people aren't really sure what the Fed is going to do. The market, the market has been schizophrenic in a lot of ways lately. But I mean, of course, that's what happens with banking failures. So um, the, the ECB is going to raise their rates, or apparently they did raise rates. And so now the Fed is like, well, okay, we've got inflation, so we have to raise rates. But you know, we can't like kill the banking system. So should we really raise rates? So but we can't look like uh, we can't look like wimps. We can't look ineffective and raise by zero. Uh, so I think probably 25 basis points would be maybe the the target expectation there. But it's it's actually it's more uncertain this week um, what the Fed is going to do in terms of raising rates than it has been in quite a while. Usually we know what the Fed is going to do, and they almost always do what the market expects. A um, couple more interesting things here. Uh, well, obviously, you know, forgetting let's we've talked enough about the um, the macro stuff, so we'll come back to this in a second. Gold and oil, some interesting things happen there, but uh, let's go to Monero so that we can understand um, what's happening with Monero. Um, so, really, not that much. Uh, Monero is not pumping with the rest of the market. Um, it's uh, you know, it's mostly Bitcoin that's pumping, actually. I mean, yes, the other coins are also kind of pumping as well. Um, we are kind of like going up. You can see, you know, we bounced, like we talked about, we hit that trend line last week and we bounced up off of that. And the, the best bet here is to expect a return to the top of the trend. If you're trading Monero, um, uh, I would imagine that, I mean, Monero is going to have positive action. If the rest of the market has positive action, it would be really nice to actually break our bear market, like our final boss bear market trend line here. Um, so at a minimum, it look, it looks at least like we've kind of, um, you know, hit that bottom and you can see this dotted line that I've drawn here. Uh, that's been kind of a, a big spot for a while, right? Like, yeah, we've kind of dipped below it, but that dotted line has been kind of, that's probably like our real legitimate support, uh, like hardcore support. Um, these dips down below it are just kind of like panic dumps when the market is panic dumping, things can temporarily go down there. And the other thing too, is when, when the market's dumping, the exchanges like to try and um, hit Monero as hard as they can while it's dumping. But this dotted line right here to me is kind of like the real support line for Monero. So. If things continue positive for the rest of the markets for the next few months, I would expect that Monero should finally break out of this line. I mean, that's typically, you know, you look at this action, you think, okay, we've got our line, we touch the line again, we touch the line again. Oh, we almost break it. No, not quite. And then we're going to come back up here. Like you really like in, in charting, at least this really is, it looks like it should break it. And sometimes it can take, take longer to do that than you hope. But um, obviously the ratio is not something that any of us are happy about at the moment. So yeah, we did kind of come down and revisit that 006 level. Uh, and now uh, we've definitely broken that down. And again, um, this is another another signal where to me, it's like, okay, Bitcoin has just massively pumped um, beyond everything else, beyond the S&P, beyond anything. And that to me is basically mostly, I mean, yes, it's driven by demand. Of course, there's demand there, but that's also driven by leverage because when there's real demand, the market makers see that leverage, they are sorry, they see that demand incoming to their exchanges and they can just pump the price very quickly on the basis of real demand. So that's what they're doing right now. Again, it, it's all the same story. In, in fact, it, it almost looks like the same kind of chart as when things were good here right before the bull market kicked off and then kind of down here to the level you expect a little bit pump and then like and then they just tried to crush it right looks almost like the same thing, but slightly smaller. So, you know, we did we did well, things were good. Um, we came down here thought, okay, that's a natural level to bounce off of. And then they just fucking crush it back down to the, to the downside, at least on the ratio. Now it's not that they're like, Hey, let's crush the ratio to the downside. It's more like, Hey, let's, you know, fraudulently pump Bitcoin with all this leverage that we have so that, um, you know, so that we can convince the plebs that it's game on again. If we go out to the zoomed out chart here, um, it does look to me like these lines down here, this guy and, uh, this other guy down here. These should be pretty good holding points. I um, again, I don't expect this is the real bull market, but you know, um, so this is June right here. If you notice down here in June, um, so we could spend some time down here. It looks like um, playing with these lines, right? We'll probably get here, maybe come down to this bottom line again. That's that's what the TA would say on this at the moment. Um, but these should hold. These should be very solid lines, especially. Um, especially since I don't think this is a real bull market. I do think that the macro still has problems. And as the bear market sort of reasserts itself, at least for a while um, later on this year, that should help Monero's price because without all the leverage, without all the bullshit pumping all the other coins and pumping Bitcoin, once that has to unwind, 
um, Monero's price, its organic price shines through relative to these other coins. So we've also got the money run coming up on April 18th. So for anyone that's not aware, it's basically last year we were sick and tired of Binance and others fractionally reserving Monero, lying, saying that they had Monero when they didn't. So we all got together and said, hey, on April 18th, let's all mass withdraw and, um, and make some purchases from Binance and or really all the exchanges. It doesn't matter. Crack in any of them. Uh, withdrawing from any exchange helps significantly. And then, of course, you know, in the month leading up to that, all, all of us are sort of front running it, you know, doing it ahead of time. And, and then, of course, they all went down for withdrawals. Binance could barely keep their withdrawals open. So we do have a good chance to maybe like stop this uh, this downtrend right here. Um, let's see, where was the money run last year? Let's see if we can place it. The money run was, yeah, so let's just go to the daily so we can see this better. Uh, so there's there's April. So technically, April 18th was right here, but really people started, um, they kind of started doing this money run thing um, early, so like in March. So this this pump right here was significantly based on the uh, the Monero run, the money run, as we call it. So it's very possible that um, that we could get some kind of nice bounce. The only The only thing that I would say that's slightly a bummer is that so while everything was crashing and the banking contagion fears were were at max levels and everything was you know just doom um binance in red here acquired a lot of monero they diverged their prices about one percent higher half a percent to one percent higher than kraken and then they did loads and loads of volume up there and just to give you an idea of how much that really is compared to any other time in the past zooming out here uh let's see that would be yeah that's february Oh, let's go to the 15 minute chart so we can look back a bit farther. Yeah, okay, so we're going all the way back here to December of last year, and you can see that this is just a huge spike up. Binance just did a massive spike up, which means to me that they acquired a lot of Monero. Um, so, again, continuing to go back, this is October, September. Um, the only other thing that we've seen that was kind of like this was when OKX diverged their prices and did a lot of volume. Even as Binance simultaneously went to the downside, I really. I'm not quite sure what to make of that, but I do think they're probably in some kind of cooperation. But the point of this chart is to say that it does look like Binance has acquired a, a reasonably decent sized stack of Monero, and they can probably use that to try and um, to try and not look like complete liars again, like they did last year during the money run. So, um, but still though, like we want to drain that liquidity from them. We want to get the word out. We because there's there's still people that don't know. I see it on Twitter. I see it on on. Uh, on reddit when i'm on there now um i'm not on reddit too often anymore but um but I, I see this everywhere people are still like a lot of people do think binance is still legitimate so we do need to get the word out there are probably still monero hodl uh, hodlers out there that think that finance is fine so um yeah i mean money run full steam ahead it, it'll be the one year anniversary april 18th is also the uh, birthday for monero so they've got this huge stack of monero you can see that um they've kind of been in negative price divergences uh ever since Let's see here. Yeah, so they kind of after they like acquired that, they kind of went down to the downside a little bit, but really this isn't like anything too major. So, um, anyways, yeah, just just know that's out there. Um, we've got the uh, we've got the ratio that's probably going to have to come play around these uh, very long term support lines. Uh, it's kind of a bummer, you know. What are you going to do? Monero ETH, same kind of uh, same kind of story. Uh, we broke down from the the trend here, and now we're, you know, there's kind of like this downtrend on the um, on the standard deviations here. So that's not. Uh, you know, obviously that doesn't make, make anyone too happy there, but uh, that's, you know, it is what it is. So last thing is um, we'll close things out with uh, with gold, oil, and a little bit of macro stuff. So gold took some pretty major bounces. Um, you know, if you remember, we kind of came up uh, here and my thinking was that we would end up to the top side of this and gold kind of surprised me by taking this big pullback and it pulled back even farther than I thought it would, um, even as the rest of the markets were pumping. But, uh, you know, with banking fears, people think, hey, I need a sovereign asset, you know, gold, they, they recognize in 2008, yes, gold pulled back with the rest of the market when it crashed, but it stopped sooner, it recovered faster, and then it went on an epic run from 2008 to 2011. So my guess is people that's still, quote unquote, fresh in uh, investors' minds. So gold took a really big pump here. Um, we'll have to see, you know, gold prices is, is also kind of manipulated. In fact, a lot of the same stuff they do with gold, they do with Monero. Uh, which is unsurprising, you know, Tether acts like the Federal Reserve, the way that they they back their assets and the way that they operate is like the Federal Reserve. So why wouldn't they pull the same tricks with suppression of gold that they do on Monero? They, they really do similar tactics there. 
Um, but at any rate, I would expect gold to at least come visit the top of this range here. Um, that's still basically game on there. Um, overall, you can see we've got this very, very large rising triangle. Oops. Uh, we got this very large rising triangle here. Uh, and this is going to break to the upside at some point. The question is when. It's a very long time frame. You can see that these lines don't even meet until 2025. Um, but if we're going to lead into a new bull market, and I do think that we eventually will, either probably like next year will be the beginning of it. There'll probably be some major systemic risk. You know, we've got so we've got the yield curve inversion. Um, if you guys remember, we've talked about the yield curve inversion uh, a number of times, and that is the pink line down here. Uh, let's quickly go to the weekly view just so we can take a a quick view of that. Essentially, um, this is kind of my own, the pink line is my own sort of um, proprietary calculation. I mean, it's not anything cosmic, so I, you know, it's not like intellectual property, but um, at any rate, uh, it, it subtracts all of the different yields from all of the other different um, yields to get a big broad view of how overall inverted is the market. And uh, we basically got more inverted than we ever have been since, uh, since the uh, 1989. Um, and this has always signaled a recession. I think like maybe one time a yield curve inversion did not signal an upcoming recession, but it can take years. It, it really can. One of the things that I'll be looking at is you can see the white line here. The white line is the federal funds rate. And the thing before the markets start crashing is the federal funds rate gets totally above all of the rest of the rates. And then everything just starts like diving down. Everyone starts panicking from stocks back into bonds. So um, you can see that happened over here in 2000. It happened in 2008. And we're basically, uh, we are in the path to make that happen right now. This, uh, the federal funds rate, if they raise again, um, right, they'll probably raise again here. Uh, so the federal funds rate will end up somewhere here, maybe here. Meanwhile, all these other rates are down here. So we're kind of looking at a similar situation as we saw right here. But again, keep in mind that that's 2006 all the way to 2007. Um, let's see, that's May of 2006 to uh, July of, of 2007. So th this can last a year, right? There's no reason that the markets have to crash now. There's no reason that recession has to hit immediately. Um, but, uh, but this is a concern. This is a long-term concern. Uh, we do have the Federal Reserve still selling off their balance sheet uh, overall and still raising rates. So like the, the, the piper will come back to be paid later on this year. But at least for now, I still think it's, uh, it's game on and markets are going up. The very last thing that I want to show you here that's just interesting is that um, oil broke down from this channel. Uh, so remember we talked about, we basically kind of want to, we want oil to be steady. We want it to be, um, we want it to stay in this channel. We don't want it to be doing crazy moves to the upside or downside. Uh, we want things overall for the markets to, to um, you know, we, we really don't want to see it break down, but maybe this is kind of a good thing. Cause if you remember, we also said, if anything, we would prefer that oil bias slightly to the downside, cause that will help to reduce costs for producers, which ultimately will bring the inflation down, which ultimately gives the markets the opportunity to, um, you know, to pump again, uh, because the federal reserve, you know, hopefully doesn't have to be so severe. So oil did break down from this. Um, I, the chart would suggest that, you know, we have further down to go, maybe, uh, maybe like kind of this area right here would be a target. So, um, yeah, that's just, I don't know, something to keep in mind there. It's not really too relevant to us, but, you know, it's a data point you kind of tuck away in your mind. So, um, oh, and then the overnight repurchase agreements are kind of just still trending sideways. Um, it, I'm not really sure what to expect with this chart. Probably just continue sideways trend. Um, probably just, you know, kind of playing in this area right here. At this point, I'm not expecting this to break to the downside anymore. I thought it might for a while, but um, I don't know. Who knows, right? It, it, it could potentially, but... Uh, at any rate, um, yeah, that's the price report today. I uh, a lot of a lot of stuff to talk about. Hopefully, I didn't uh, fly too fast on this one. A lot of things, <laughs> a lot man. Of a lot of stuff. Great job, man. Very very comprehensive. Cool. Uh, and I guess we'll see what happens this week. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's no guarantees that things pump, you know, immediately, but overall, like for the upcoming weeks and or months, uh, it does look like we should see positive action. So you touched upon the money supply. Wasn't that wasn't there some kind of like uh, like a kind of a new low that was hit with the money supply? And, but I guess it bounced back up. Yeah. So this is the M2 money stock right here. It's basically all. So M2 is all of M1 money plus. Uh, so M1 is cash and coins uh, and checking. Uh, so basically like immediate demand deposits m2 is all time deposits of less than one year plus all of m1 so it's kind of like all of the liquid cash available uh, in the market or liquid dollars available in the system so we've basically been on a downtrend you can see since um 
what would that be? Really since 2022, right? So that, that's actually March of 2022. Uh, it's been on a downtrend. So we saw kind of this tick up right here, but we're not, this is all delayed. You can see the last data that we have is from, uh, is from January. So, you know, we're, we're over here in, in March and uh, we don't have any of this data yet. So I, I need to try and look this up. That I haven't been able to find a Wednesday level, like a weekly report on the M2 money stock. Um, like for example, uh, you do see that here in, um, actually, let's go over here. So you do see that here in the total assets on the Federal Reserve balance sheet, which is different from the M2. So this is shot up. I assume that that will be reflected in the M2 money as well. I, I have to believe that um, because of the, the relative bullishness we've seen over the past couple months, and then now the recent action on the Federal Reserve balance sheet, I have to assume that this is going up there's got to be some kind of like weekly report on this number. I just haven't been able to find it yet. So if anyone out there like knows what that is, please hit me up. All right, man. Uh, thank you so much. We're going to quickly move ahead because we have a, still have a very <laughs> a long show. Long so show ahead. It's um, like our conference. We got the whole, <laughs> the whole M ordinals, NFTs on Monero topic to cover, which hopefully Bonnie, you can stick around for that. That's going to be. Sure. I'll try. I might actually be able to now with the time change. I have an extra hour with you guys that I didn't think I had. So yeah. oh, awesome. <laughs> awesome. Okay, great. So stick around. All right. Thank you so All much. Guys. We'll see you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Talk to you later. Thank you, buddy.